what can go wrong and how do you prevent it or recognize what happened? If you end up filing to get them to fit, you had too little of the jaw on the anvil and it would be necessary for you to pull that back a little bit. If you end up with too long a neck, which is my favorite trick to do, you had too much jaw on the anvil and you need to push forward a little bit. If the, one or the other happens to you, adjust accordingly. When I set this shoulder in there, I tend to pull back a little too hard. I've, I've been able to correct that because I recognize what was happening. You should be able to set that shoulder and just hold it in place. And with your hand on the other end, hold that down like pressure on the top of the bar and that should be enough leverage to hold that in place so that it doesn't bounce around or move on you. In this case, move to the point where you got a really long neck here that will make these tongs a little weaker. Will they still work? Yeah, probably. Put them together, see how they go. But you have created a weak area. The other thing you that can go wrong is you end up over forging when you're dressing the boss. So even though our hit is the right direction and everything's nice and parallel, this ended up way too thin. Now there's nothing to support it when you try to crisp up this corner and it's just gonna end up flat. You hit here, this metal's just gonna squish down. This is a do-over. This isn't going to um, be corrected at this point, which is fine. All practice is good practice. The other thing that can happen is that you can round out this crisp edge, which some people make their tongs like that. It's, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. It's just not what we're going for here, either with the practicing of this particular skill set or trying to get that crisp corner so that our tongs stay under control when we're holding on to them. So hammer handle should be vertical. The other thing that can go wrong is you might end up something with something that, that looks a little wonky like this. We've got all the right steps in place, but everything's a little curvy where we don't want it curvy. When you hit the metal with the hammer, it is going to curl just a little. You'll get some bowing in there. This is way beyond bowing or the natural bowing that happens when you hit something with the hammer. This says more about how this material was being held when you created each step. The metal is the world's biggest tattletale and it will tell on you. And the, if you've, the angle here tells you what you were doing in terms of how you were holding this metal. So as you go along, if you find that you're fighting this and end up knocking this straight and then it comes back here and then you're knocking it straight or maybe it ends up this direction, really pay attention to how you're holding on to this material at the other end. When you're holding on to this, it should be snug up against your side with a very firm, but relaxed grip um, to hold it in the right position. The other result of not keeping it straight is you're gonna end up with cracks here and you're gonna end up with cracks here. It's very similar to cracks you would end up with if you were using too sharp of an edge of the anvil and none of those cracks are a good thing in a pair of tongs. So just a quick things to think about it's very easy to end up with the boss too small or the jaw too small, and that's just telling you that it's been overworked. Try to cycle through the steps, keeping everything straight, which again says more about how you're holding on to the material than anything. And 
I always like to leave a little extra so that as I cycle through, I can refine it and get it to the right width or a little more hef hefty width of the, the three eighths on the boss and the three eighths on the jaw. Now I want to move into just thinking about efficiency since we've accomplished these steps so nicely and start to link your heats together. We'll watch uh, this first, this video, we're gonna go through the, the jaw and the boss and then watch the jaw and the boss all happen with one heat. It's very important that this heat be as far back as this one is and a pretty bright yellow happening here. So as this is being forged, notice how this is held horizontal, even though initially the shoulder had the hand down a little bit. Set this shoulder in place, heel of the hammer, digging in to create a nice even boss. Starting to lose a little heat here, so won't be able to move on to the next step. Because if you do work this cold, you're going to get more of that anvil creep and the shoulder won't end up exactly where you want it to be on any of these sides. So again, a nice long heat. We've got a bright yellow heat moving into the boss transition. Digging in with the heel, still hanging on to a nice yellow heat here turning that 90 degrees away from the hammer hand on the far side of the anvil, straightening that out and fullering in that rain transition, correcting for growth as you go. So there we have it, a jaw assembly, all ready to be cut off and uh, reins welded on. But before we do that, I wanna do just a little quick review of what it's like in the left-handed world and why it's important to think about this as turning away from the hammer hand. So we set the initial jaw, turn it to the right, not the left, but that's away from the hammer hand, set the boss down and fuller in that reins transition. So notice that if you're holding your hammer in your left hand, turning away from your hammer hand has to be turning to the right. Once you have your boss dressed, it's time to dress the jaw. You do that by bringing in the sides. For this project, it's gonna be down to a th three quarter inch width and setting a slight taper on the end. You can really see the taper here. To get that taper in there, you're gonna bring in the toes just a little bit first because as you hit the taper, you're gonna get growth from side to side. It's gonna grow in width. So bring in the toes to set that taper and end up back at your three quarter inch wide. And then you can go back and dress the sides and um, finish off this whole jaw section. The reason for this taper is probably more aesthetics, like it just looks better, but so it's, it's not essential, but there is some, some gain you might get with having a taper there, either by it'll, it'll move through coals in your fire, but when you're putting your piece in the, in the forge and, and, and maneuvering past the coals or picking something up off the ground. So let's watch a jaw being dressed. So bring in the sides. Notice how straight this material is being held. Bring in the, the very tip just a little bit so that now when you set that taper, 
it grows out to the width that matches up with the three quarters that we're going for. That little maneuver there at the end That little maneuver there at the end, um, taking that back and forth. I'm gonna back that up just a second. I have to turn my laser pointer off to do that. So that little maneuver, um, there we go, this. That maneuver there, that will clean up any marks that might have happened when you were dressing the boss. And make sure that that inside shoulder is nice and smooth. It also, as you were correcting the width here for the jaw, if you have, after you've done that, there's going to be some um, unevenness on the up underside of this. Uh, so that, that I'm going to show you one more time, that going here to here, we'll smooth out all of that as well. So now we're ready to measure and see that we have our one inch by one inch on the boss. So I just want to point out, and, and this might be common sense to everyone, but I might, I just want to point out that the volume stays consistent. We took three quarter by three quarter. We laid it off at one and three sixteenths of an inch, but our goal was to flatten that down to three eighths and half, basically. When I take it down to a half inch, it becomes one inch wide, but it stretches to one and a quarter inch long. Knowing how that metal is gonna act becomes very important. I, I did the math on the volumes. Um, this is 0.67 and this is 0.64. So I lost something in the measurement there, but it's, it's, it's very close to the same exact measurement. Um, that's an important point and something that I think you should work on practicing and then continue to measure the result. In fact, if you use the storyboard concept where you make the jaw, set it aside, make the, get a fresh piece of material, make the jaw and the boss, set it aside, and then do all three steps, you'll be able to measure what happened and what changed as you moved from step to step and compare them. This is something that I use frequently, especially if I'm, you know, trying to make something new or figure something out. The whole storyboard concept really helps cement in not only the skill, but the knowledge of how the metal moves as you hit it. And um, it's always doing more than just flattening. It gets wider and it gets longer. So now we're ready to punch the hole for the rivet. Is it 100% imperative that you punch the hole for your tongs? No. Um, you could drill the hole, especially if you're worried about them and um, you've become attached to these, these tongs at this point. But punching the hole is more expedient. And again, it's another skill set that you get to develop as you perfect tong making. So to punch a hole, you're simply going through the metal all the way down till you, till you reach the bottom. And then you're turning them over and punching that slug out from the other side. The only caveat I would add is that you start, that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work backwards. We want to end up so that the flat side, and there is only one flat side on these tongs, 
or this jaw assembly at this point, we want to end up with the flat side on the anvil. That gives you the opportunity to move this anywhere you want to go, and in this case, over the Pritchell hole to get that slug out. So start with this shoulder protected on the hard side or the side that can't go anywhere on your anvil. Punch all the way through till you hit the bottom, turn it over, and you'll, you'll see a little shadow of the where it reached bottom, punch back through. So let's watch that happen on the video. So very first step, you're on, you've got the hard, hard side down first with the shoulder protected. Make that mark and check it. Make sure it's right where you want it. Then you can continue punching all the way through till you hit the bottom. You'll feel it and you'll hear it. It's important to keep your tool quenched as you go. So, you know, three hits, quench it in the water. Now you can move this anywhere you want to go. Find that outline, that shadow, and punch all the way through. And in this case, keep drifting till you have it to whatever size rivet you're going to be putting in there, either uh, three-eighths if you like, um, a nice big rivet or uh, five sixteenths. Both are acceptable rivet sizes. That last little maneuver there, um, and I'll back it up just a second. Using this nut allows you to correct the taper that you put in there by drifting with a tapered drift. And then as always, keep everything straight. The material as you punch the hole and correct the, the as you drift the, the hole size, the material is gonna draw down into there. It could even draw down into the pritchel hole. And uh, working that on the other side, using the nut to protect the shoulder will um, allow you to correct that. Now, if you didn't want to drift uh, that way with a, a, a tapered tool, in this case, it's a punch also being used as a drift, you can use a pin drift, which is just a little piece of your rivet material that you taper both sides and you just run that through um, over the Pritchell hole to get a nice even hold the size, drifted to the size of your rivet. Now you can make your other side. And I wanna point out that making the other side doesn't involve any new set of skills. It's, they're not mirror images. They're exactly the same piece. They're forged exactly to the same shape. And then when you match them up, they uh, go together nicely. So I did have a break here for questions, if anyone has any.